Seth, for several hundred years, until about a century ago, the universe was a very mechanical, deterministic system that made, made advances. But in the last hundred years, the concept of interactions between things in the universe that affects it has become increasingly important. And the term that's been used is observer, um, which is a common term, but from a scientific point of view, let's understand what that means. What are observers? Well, Robert, in some sense, every physical system ranging from the size of elementary particles like in electrons up to human beings, society itself, or stars and planets, <laughs> or even the whole universe can be considered an observer because every physical system is interacting with its surroundings and getting information about it. So uh, if getting information about the rest of the universe is observing it, then even an electron is an observer. But what does that mean? It sounds like if everything is it, then it's almost like nothing is. It's like a, it's like a uh, literary device as opposed to a deep way of understanding. Uh, well, I think it's a deep way of understanding. Of course, what, what you do with the information after you get it differs very much. An electron can only hold, say, one bit of information on its spin, spin up or spin down. Mm -hmm. um, that's not a lot of information, whereas human beings can hold billions of bits of information in their brain, and society as a whole has Avogadro's numbers of bits <laughs> of information floating around. So uh, uh, what you do with the information after you get it varies a lot from observer to observer. So how does this way of thinking uh, affect uh, our deep understanding of science? Well, um, as you were saying, uh, when people believed the world was described by Newtonian classical mechanics, then the notion of an observer wasn't necessarily that important because Newtonian mechanics postulates that the world just exists, does its <coughs> thing, and then observers can observe it, but they can observe it without ever disturbing it. You know, you can observe it with such a, a light touch that you never make any difference in the way that the systems behave. Mm. But a hundred years ago, when quantum mechanics came to the fore, and people realized you had to use quantum mechanics to describe the universe, then an observer plays a more central role because you can't get information about a, a physical system, a quantum mechanical system, without disturbing it. And that type of uh, disturbing is a uh, measurement classically, um, but does that have to have a sentient observation, as some have claimed, which sounds <laughs> incredible. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, famous scientists like Eugene Wigner claim that, you know, a measurement doesn't take place until a conscious being is aware of the result. Um, uh, that seems going a bit far to me. So, uh, uh, as I said, any interaction will um, get information. So, in fact, in, in, in order to kind of make something happen, all that's necessary for, is for one electron to come by, bump into another electron, get information, and that's enough to make something happen. But again, is that, is that more metaphor? Because everybody knew that things were, billiard balls were colliding with each other. Is that just another way of describing the same situation? I mean, that, that, that was no secret when things hit each other or, or interact, that each one does something different thereafter, like billiard balls in its most simplistic case. Yeah, but the problem in quantum mechanics is that you have this quantum weirdness, you know, this central quantum weirdness called wave-particle duality, where, you know, electron over here corresponds to a wave over here, electron over there corresponds to a wave over there, but electron here and there at the same time yeah. corresponds to wave in both places at once. So then the question is, why do we see electron in one place rather than another? And the notion of, of an observer is invoked to say, oh, electron will show up either here or there if an observer comes in to see that it's here or see that it's there. And the observer in that case is a measurement, not necessarily a sentient creature. Right, and the problem is that, that you know, it, it looks as if the, the ordinary description of quantum mechanics is that a measurement apparatus comes in and measures it here or measures it there, but if the measurement apparatus is itself a quantum mechanical system, then... Which, which everything is. Which everything is, then actually the quantum description of what's going on is not either measurement apparatus finding it here or measurement apparatus finding it there, but measurement apparatus okay. finding it here and there simultaneously, and that's kind of a bummer. And, and then you have, but you have a, a quantum system interacting with two sep separate quantum systems, so that 
multiplies the, <laughs> the problem, I would think. Yeah, that's right. And so, so I, I think Wigner uh, uh, and others actually said, well, what could it possibly be that makes things finally be here or there rather than here and there at the same time? And mm. he said consciousness, sure. for better or worse. <laughs> <laughs> And, and what, what was the history before that with the Bohr and the Copenhagen interpretation? What, what was that early history and those kinds of discussions? So uh, the Copenhagen interpretation, which is not, by the way, a very nailed down thing. I'm, it, it, many physicists will say they ascribe to it. It's called Copenhagen interpretation because Niels Bohr was from Copenhagen and, it, 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 and espoused it there. Um, Bohr's position, which he was very careful about, Bohr had a very kind of legalistic way of describing things. You could never kind of catch him out, but it's not very satisfying from a physical perspective. Bohr's idea was that um, measurement <coughs> causes things to be either here or there. And then, but when people said, but the measurement apparatus is itself a quantum system. So what's going on? Who's measuring mm, the measuring mm. apparatus? Bohr said, no, it's not like that. Really the measurement is kind of a philosophically different notion than just a quantum mechanical thing being here and there at the same time. So, but of course it's physically just a quantum mechanical system. So people had a hard time understanding it. So yeah, the ordinary notion is that measurement apparatus comes in, a measurement apparatus is in some sense a different thing described classically in some sense, and it makes the electron either be here or there rather than here or there, Ignore here and there at the same time. Ignoring the fact that the measurement system itself is a quantum mechanical thing, can you do that? Well, that's what Bohr was trying to do. Yeah. I mean, you can do whatever you want, but it's not very convincing. I mean, this problem, the measurement problem in quantum mechanics has been around ever since quantum mechanics and nobody has ever resolved it satisfactorily. And in my opinion, nobody ever will. <laughs> why? why? Why will nobody ever will? That's a big statement. Oh, because um, it, it's uh, uh, the, the point is to resolve it satisfactorily. I mean, we're human beings, right? So we want to be satisfied with an explanation. We're satisfied about a lot of explanations. We are. But the problem is that quantum mechanics, this thing about things being in two places at the same time, this is just counteracts our, our intuition. And it always will. And we're never going to get some explanation which makes us go away, so it's always going to be unsatisfactory. Or there can be some deeper system that gives rise to quantum mechanics. Some people think that that's more deterministic at a, at a deeper level that somehow yields the, 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 the oddness of quantum mechanics at the level that we can observe it today. Yeah, absolutely. So there's a funny phenomenon that, that, that I note, which is that um, people who get their Nobel Prize in quantum mechanics uh, don't necessarily believe in it. <laughs> the most famous example of this is Einstein, who got his Nobel Prize for the photoelectric effect, yeah. which is a quantum mechanical phenomenon. Sure. Einstein famously <laughs> never believed in quantum mechanics. And, <laughs> and I could name several uh, Nobel laureates in quantum mechanics today <laughs> who don't believe in it. And they all hope that something will come along to alter quantum mechanics from the way it is right now that allows us to trust our intuition that things are <laughs> actually <laughs> here <laughs> or there rather than here <laughs> and there. And to them I say, Good luck. Yeah. And, you, and why do you say that? Why do you think that'll never happen? Um, I just think quantum mechanics is just counterintuitive, and that's mm. the way it is. Mm. In some sense, there's no reason why things at the microscopic level, like electrons and photons, need and to waves, behave like us. Yeah. Why should they actually conform with our macroscopic intuitions, right, right. which have been, you know, evolved uh, over millions of years to conform with the way things behave at the macroscopic? level. Right. No reason why electrons should behave the same way at the microscopic level as things behave at the macro level. T take me through a little bit of the history when Bohr uh, proposed this sentient necessity uh, back in the what, 1920s. Uh, uh, what, were this, what was the reaction time? What happened since? Were there different sides at that point? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> it's been a long ongoing okay. uh, and in some sense traumatic experience for physicists. Uh -huh. um, so Bohr proposed this Copenhagen interpretation back in the 20s, as you say, might be been even a little earlier. And uh, uh, <clears throat> um, it's unsatisfactory because it postulates this dualism between you know, microscopic quantum mechanical things and macroscopic classical things, whereas you know, physicists tend to believe if quantum mechanics describes electrons and if uh, measurement apparatuses are made out of electrons and atoms, then quantum mechanics should describe the measurement apparatus as well. And Bohr seems to be saying, oh, no, that's not true. So that's not very satisfactory. So what was, then, the, what was the reaction at the time among other physicists? 
Well, they, they uh, you know, they respected Bohr and people said they were going to accept it, but people were concerned about it. So then, and you know, it, it's not satisfactory. And, and uh, John von Neumann and Heisenberg and Schrodinger and other people worked hard to try to come up with ways of understanding it that didn't work very well. <laughs> then this around, after the Second World War, this was uh, superseded by what is called the shut up and calculate school. <laughs> right. The shut up and calculate school says, let's not worry about <laughs> this. Let's just, you know, let's just do it. Shut up and calculate. It gives the right answers for the results of measurements. So let's simply not worry about these strange philosophical issues. So you're a, 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 a card carrying member of the second school? No, I, I actually, I think that there, it's a more subtle question. After in the 1950s, a, a truly bizarre um, interpretation of quantum mechanics arose, which is called the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. And that says, you know, if you have an electron that's here and there at the same time, and measurement apparatus comes in and detects it to be here, detects it to be there, then what happens is the world splits into two worlds, one of which the electron is over here and the measurement apparatus has detected it to be over here, and the other of which the electron is there and the measurement apparatus has detected it to be over there. But both of these worlds exist in some quantum mechanical fashion. And so we have many worlds, uh, in fact, not just two, not just four, not just eight, but gajillions of worlds. This is a technical term. And, uh, and so the world is constantly splitting into multiple worlds uh, in which different things happen. And when I hear that, um, I, I think that this must be a very deep problem to have to go to that extreme to try to get a satisfactory answer. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's true. And, and the problem is that if you actually just say everything is just quantum mechanical, the measurement apparatus is quantum mechanical, the systems are quantum mechanical, um, and you follow the dynamical evolution of what happens, that's what happens. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, unless you put in something else, then you're kind of stuck with this many worlds theory. Mm -hmm. Many people don't like this, <laughs> not surprisingly. <laughs>